Thank you for joining the Delivering Interactive Experience with GLTF webinar. We will begin shortly, but first, a couple of housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the presentations, please ask them using the Q&A feature located on your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We are recording this webinar and we'll share the link along with the slides when they are available. At the end of the session, please complete the short survey form to help us better design future events. With that, let's get the webinar started with Brent Scannell, 3D Formats Chair and Senior Product Manager at Autodesk. Brent? Thank you, Jeff. Um, so as Jeff mentioned, I am the 3D Formats Working Group Chair, and I want to welcome everybody to this webinar. Um, before we get started, I'd like to provide a bit of context about why we're talking about interactivity and behaviors today. Um, if we go back about a year, maybe 18 months ago, we really started to brainstorm in the working group about what the next big drivers in the ecosystem are going to be and where GLTF can make some impactful progress. We knew that some use cases were gonna need even more PBR, more photorealism for maybe commerce use cases. We looked at interactions and maybe simulation requirements, what, where avatars were going, uh, physical attributes, what, what kind of roles will those play and what we might need to do inside of GLTF and even going into things like AR anchoring systems. We looked at adoption issues and even spooled up a tooling subgroup to directly help develop libraries to help adopters get a head start. And the list goes on and on and on. A few topics kept bubbling to the top of the list, however, in part fueled by open metaverse discussions and what role GLTF could and should be playing there. But we knew we needed to close a few important functionality gaps, especially around interactivity. Now, it wasn't exactly obvious how we're gonna close these gaps, even if we recognized that they were important and valuable to close. And we heard proposals from members and counter proposals from industry veterans and advisors and together, we've spent the last few months cooperatively refining these proposals. Today, you'll hear about what we're planning to do to close these gaps and to ensure that GLTF maintains the position that you all expect it to in an open metaverse. To help me tell this story, it is my pleasure to introduce Dwight Rogers, Director of Engineering at Adobe, and Ben Houston, Chief Technology Officer at 3Kids. Dwight, the screen is all yours. Well, thank you. Uh, I will share the slides. There we go. Hope everyone can see that. Um, so yes, we're here to talk about uh, interactivity. And uh, so interactivity should be pretty simple, right? We take a 3D model, uh, we put it on our website, we add some JavaScript and that's interactivity and we're all done. So you don't really need to be here. You can all go home now. Uh, unless there are some problems with that model because for example, you're trying to get your content onto a third party page and that third party page is not willing to let you run arbitrary JavaScript. Maybe you're targeting something that's not in the browser. You're trying to put something on a headset or something into mobile and you don't have a browser there. Uh, maybe you want your content to work the same everywhere. And so you, you have a bigger problem than just, um, than just uh, JavaScript with, with one particular uh, API surface. So what we're looking at is how do we put content and interactivity uh, together and uh, composable uh, for use in third-party viewers? And the way that we're thinking about this problem uh, is that you have a continuum from uh, situations where you need um, uh, very high expressive power because you wanna do things that are really cool, uh, all the way down to you have very restrictive uh, security or uh, control uh, issues where your content has to be restricted in certain ways, has to be predictable in certain ways. And we wanna see if there's a system we can make for uh, different layers of capability uh, that will bridge this whole continuum. So at the top end, we are hoping for uh, creating a system that has rough, roughly parity with the systems that exist in top uh, game engines. And to describe that side, uh, we'll move to Ben Houston. Hello, everyone. Um, next slide, please. So what are behavior graphs? Behavior graphs um, are what you've seen um, in top end game engines. They basically, they're for representing um, behavior in both assets, experiences, and levels. They're used for all three. Um, and I guess they're, they're becoming more popular in things that are sort of aiming towards being a metaverse. Um, so they are more high end than just web experiences, but web experiences can sort of be seen as a subset of that. Um, let me just talk a bit more about the specific ones. Can you go to the next slide? So the first one that really became prominent was uh, Blueprints within Unreal Engine. Uh, it's sort of the prototypical behavior graph system uh, in the high end. 
um, came out, I guess, in 2013, roughly. Uh, and it allows for artists to create tons of content for game engines um, without requiring their C++ brethren to get involved. So it really speeds up iteration time. Uh, and it has proved to be easy to understand and get going with. Um, and that led um, to the next slide. Um, it's been now sort of copied within that industry. Uh, they may not say so, but uh, Blueprints really started the trend and now uh, Unity has a near equivalent. Um, the nodes are almost identical. It's Unity Visual Scripting. I think it was originally called Bolt. They, they acquired it and then integrated it into the tool. And now you can do that same type of rapid iteration without requiring a coder to make your game logic. Uh, next slide. It also has been um, adopted by NVIDIA's Omniverse technology. Uh, in that case, it's called OmniGraph. It's about, I think it's about two years old at this point. Um, and they use it for doing all of their behavior um, within Omniverse. Um, they use it for both behaviors. Um, they also are using it for, I think, materials and a few other things as well. Uh, so they use it much more widely than the other tools do. Um, yeah, that's the three main ones that we're sort of looking at at the high end to inspire our work. Uh, next slide. So what is a behavior graph? Well, here's a very simple one. We have an event that fires, and then it's printing out a string. This is sort of the hello world. So um, it's composed of these nodes. These nodes uh, form a graph. On each node, there's a series of sockets. On the event node that you see, the event begin play, there's a single output flow node that goes into the uh, input flow node. Uh, on the print string node, and then you have some uh, one other input called in string, and they've just used a constant here called hello, um, and they haven't linked it up to anything. So you have sockets, you have socket types, you have links between the nodes and graphs. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So the nodes come in a lot of different flavors, um, and they're very different. So events start execution. Um, in Unreal Engine Blueprints, they're usually red. Um, you have actions. Actions cause something in the scene to change. So you might start animation, you may set the color for something. Even logging is technically an action. Um, they have variables. So they allow for objects um, to have some type of state. So you can say the door is open, and that could be a Boolean. And if it's false, it's closed. Uh, and then you can respond to that state. When it changes, you can set that state. Um, you can do queries. Queries allow for you to query things in the scene graph. Uh, the user and player environment, um, such as I can ask uh, if another object has a variable set, like is that door open? Or is there a player within the hitbox of my object? Although usually you'd probably use that for uh, an event. Um, logic is really interesting. Logic allows you to do calculations. So you can have nodes that represent, uh, like once you have these variables, you can then go, hey, uh, if the door is open and uh, also this event fired, then I want to do this action. So now you can sort of combine, do Boolean logic, you can do comparisons, you can do math operations. So you can modify vectors to like rotate something or move something in a specific way. Very powerful um, and allows for a lot of composability. The last type of node is flow. These are that white nodes you see or the white sockets you see here. This is the flow of which execution follows. Um, and so flow nodes would be like an if statement, a for loop, a sequence node, um, delays, they, they follow the execution. Um, OK, uh, next, next slide. So again, um, what I was trying to say is that the white sockets here are called flow nodes, or that's one, what we're calling them, and then execution follows them. So you can see here we have a branch that has a true and a false coming out of it. We have the other nodes connected to the true node, the true socket output. And that means that if this branch, uh, the condition that goes into it is true, then it will fire those nodes. Otherwise, it would fire what's attached to false. Um, the other nodes that don't have these sort of white flow nodes on or fl flow sockets on them are, are what we're calling intermediate nodes, and they're usually logic nodes, and they get calculated on demand. Um, so they have a different execution model to them. Next slide. One of the ideas with uh, graph-based models is that all the nodes are relatively atomic, simple, um, and uh, you create complex behaviors by combining them together. So what this does is because the nodes are simple, um, you're not presupposing what that user wants to do. You're just giving them, here's all the options of things you can query. Here's some flow control structures. Here's some things you can set. And it's up to you to figure out how you want to link those together. Um, so you can basically do anything um, 
if there's an action and a query or an event that allows you to do it. Uh, it can be quite powerful that way. It's very composable. Um, biggest downside is you can make really big graphs and and then maybe they get out of control, but that's actually a good thing. It means you're actually leveraging this um, quite well. Um, it tries to stay away from compound nodes that are both an action, a condition, event, and logic all in one. Um, it Rather, it focuses on this composability. Uh, yeah, next slide. That you can view these as a, a layered a set of layered systems. They're sort of the core functionality for a behavior graph that um, has like your control flow structures, your if-else, your events, um, such as uh, custom events or life cycle. You have your logic nodes. You have your uh, actions and variables. That's sort of like what a behavior graph is. And then you start adding nodes that are more specific to the, uh, the context in which you're working. So if you have a scene graph, which in the context of GLTF, we always do, um, you can start querying for scene graph events and then modifying that scene graph. You might add some more logic nodes that are three um, math specific. If you want to have, you have animation capabilities, then you're going to have uh, figuring out if animations fire uh, when they complete, uh, starting them. If you have different input methods, such as like touch or keyboard or mouse, you can then listen to events on those fronts uh, and react to them. Uh, this can continue on for like augmented reality. If you're having tracking, uh, you detect face. Um, if you have audio you want to play, you can keep adding more categories and nodes based on additional context you want to run in uh, and respond to. Uh, back to you, Dwight, I believe. Oh, no, sorry, I skipped that. There's a few more slides there. Um, there's a, so the security model for behavior graphs is actually relatively simple. Because it's a bunch of nodes, you can only do what those nodes um, allow you to do. And those nodes are predefined. You can't add nodes that don't exist in that engine already. You can only say you want to call them. So if there's no nodes that let you query for a file on disk, or ask for the current time, or um, ask personal information about that user, you can't do that. So because the nodes are defined, and you choose which set of nodes you're going to allow the user to this, the, this GLTF to use, you're creating a sandbox there. The other thing that um, you do is you figure out how many nodes you want to execute in each time slice. So you have at will execution. This means it does avoid um, someone coming up with infinite loop. Because as soon as you have a for loop or events that custom events that can be triggered, you can do a lot of things. So by having, um, you can uh, implement the engine such that it only executes like say a thousand nodes at most, or you give it a specific time slice, like I'm gonna give you one millisecond to execute. And you just do what you can. And then next time I have a time slice for you, I can come back and give you more time. The other thing that we can do um, is we can do uh, back one slide. Perfect. Load time validation. Um, because these are uh, fully explicitly defined, um, we can validate that all those nodes are valid. They're supported by the system. We can also check that there's no infinite uh, loops in the graph itself. Um, we can also ensure that all the values are, are correct. Um, they're valid. So we can do a bunch of validation there, although we can't truly figure out halting but we can uh, figure out truly degenerate graphs. Next slide. There is some uh, common arguments against behavior graphs. Uh, one is they're too incomplete. Um, turns out that once you want to add good interactivity behavior to anything, you're probably going to get a Turing complete system. Turing complete is actually really easy to achieve. You just need some type of state, and you need to be able to like call it again. Um, and it's very easy to do that if you can do any type of queries and sets. So I would argue that we, in, Turing completeness is not an argument against behavior graphs. Um, rather, we should just ensure that we only, in implementations, they only give specific time slices of time to any one of these behavior graphs so that um, they're not doing a uh, denial of service by just executing forever. The other one is some people have argued that um, to adding these types of interactivity is insecure. But I would argue the, the security model I talked about before, where they can only execute the nodes that you specified beforehand, that can act as a sandbox, even if you're executing within a C++ context that is not secure by default. Most of us do execute here um, in like a JavaScript context. That's relatively secure, even if you don't have a good security model. Um, but yeah, as long as you validate your graph is only calling your nodes and you ensure that your nodes are implemented correctly, it should be relatively secure. Uh, next slide. Um, some people have argued that uh, behavior graphs seem really complex to implement. 
and that um, by adopting behavior graphs, we are making GLTF harder to be adopted, uh, this aspect of GLTF hard to be adopted. So in response to that, we've implemented um, a open source behavior graph library that implements all of these primitives um, in what we consider to be a reference implementation fashion. Um, and you can see it, it's linked there, you can download it, you can try it out. Uh, and then a number of people have uh, brought up the fact that, hey, my app doesn't use behavior graphs. I have a different creation uh, UX paradigm because my users are very, very specific users who want to do something in a constrained fashion. Um, behavior graphs are incredibly flexible. This means that for the most part, it can likely represent your um, design ideas, your interactivity designs. They can be compiled down to behavior graphs and therefore you can still have that design of your choice. That's because behavior graphs are incredibly composable and flexible. And uh, if we support metadata on them, you could probably even load them back into your constrained UI because it can identify what you compiled down to that. So um, I think that one is the last slide. Yes. Oh yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> cool. Thank you for uh, for explaining that. I think um, behavior graphs definitely very powerful. Uh, excellent, excellent way of of getting things done. I uh, hope many people on the call are already familiar with them. But for those uh, who weren't, uh, hopefully that helps uh, clarify where we're looking for at the um, uh, towards the higher ends. Uh, so let's come back a little bit to the 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 other end of that spectrum, um, and let's particularly look at um, sort of third party properties. Uh, imagine that you had, for example. Uh, an art gallery or a virtual marketplace or a wayfinding um, maps system where um, where people wanted to be able to put their own content. So some particular uh, person's creating some product to go on a on a virtual marketplace shelf or something to go on a on the virtual art gallery wall or something to go in front of their business in a in a, a in a virtual reality mapping um, position. Now, it is quite reasonable that the um, people running these systems may want to make sure that your uh, space on the shelf, uh, whatever you put there, doesn't go and expand and occupy all the spaces uh, next to you. And, and sure, maybe you could do that dynamically at runtime by putting constraints back on when the behavior tries to move your object, you go and unmove it. But then you have sort of unpredictable results. You don't know what will have happened to their experience when, when you're uh, when you're undoing their transforms in order to keep them in their bounding box. Um, and what if your art gallery is supposed to be family friendly, but there's some chaotic system inside there, a random number generator that one out of a million times is going to replace your totally wonderful family friendly content with something uh, completely inappropriate that as an art gallery, you don't want uh, to have uh, to have showing there. Um, and so that's the question of what can we do at sort of this, this, this zeroth layer um, where all that expressive power, which was wonderful, it makes it very hard for, for this uh, cute little leopard here to enforce the rules that he is trying to enforce uh, in one of these constrained systems. And so we are thinking that at this uh, zeroth layer of uh, capability, uh, predictability is really important. And so data processing and dynamic control flow may be things that we want to eliminate from that layer. Uh, Similarly, for security, we may want to eliminate any sort of allocation, iteration, data access, web access. All these things are great when you're trying to produce something powerful, uh, and they're not when you're specifically trying not to produce something powerful because you need uh, to enforce your rules and you need to be able to evaluate the content programmatically to confirm that it, that it follows your rules. So our question for ourselves and, and for everyone that we are going to think about soon is, can we use a common framework throughout all of these layers, all the way down from the zero width, all the way up to the top, where the same system of node graphs applies, named inputs, named outputs, connections. Um, can we keep that system even when we're trying to hit um, this most controlled level? Uh, and what we're thinking right now is that maybe we can. Maybe what we can do is we can say, you know what, all that math and control flow, we take that out at the lowest level, we're still using a node graph structure, but we say, it's only constants. That's the only values that you can put in for parameters. You can only go next, 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 and nothing can act unless user interaction has caused it to happen. That's one of the, the common frameworks on the web, or I didn't want you to open another browser window. I didn't want you to do this, that, or the other. We have to do that as only in response uh, to explicit action. 
And then uh, we're thinking that at, at that zeroth level, you still, of course, need to be able to do some things, maybe play animations, maybe uh, move objects to pre-specified locations, maybe play audio. And so at that level, you'd want to make sure that um, the number of actions is uh, a small uh, so that you can easily secure them, implement them, optimize them, uh, review them, obviously, so that when someone submits some content, we can see, uh, is, it, uh, is it appropriate or not? And so the big question is, well, can you still do anything useful at that level? Or is that so restrictive that nothing good can come of it? And uh, so here's a, a just simple demo of the type of content that we that we hope could be created. There are just two examples. Um, we've created these in a system where we believe the uh, necessary restrictions are in place. And so here would be an example of a bicycle configurator where we may want to be able to uh, allow the user to tap on various things to configure their bicycle, choose the handles, choose the wheels, choose the uh, materials. Um, and uh, all of this is created uh, entirely in response to user action, and all of it's created uh, in a way that's that's programmatically verifiable what it's going to do. And it even allows us to adjust like seat position as well as as well as just swapping um, colors and textures. Um, and then uh, another example we've got is, um, here we've got uh, informational, uh, educational, entertainment sort of content uh, helping to understand about orbital mechanics and, and orbits. And again, uh, we want to be able to have a variety of, of animation capabilities. We want to have things that you can click on to get more information about low Earth orbit or geosynchronous orbits. We want uh, information that, that appears, maybe a uh, billboard so that the user can always uh, read it or see it easily. Um, and we think all that should be should be doable, uh, even when you need to enforce the constraint that this particular exhibit has to fit within a particular bounding box or things of that sort. So we're imagining that maybe this is more than just a normal onion model of layer one, layer two, layer three. It may be more like a sprouted potato, because you may have things like audio. Playing audio may be something that's completely reasonable to do, even at the zeroth layer. Whereas something like uh, network data access uh, may be something that you really only want to do in some unique cases of the of the topmost powerful layer, um, but audio is also usable uh, in all the other layers. Of course, you want everything that you do at one layer to be available at the layers above, um, but audio is not currently uh, in GLTF yet, and so. As extensions come in, an extension for audio, an extension for geospatial, an extension for network data access, et cetera, all of those could define their own new nodes and define at what layers uh, should those new nodes become available. So that's most of what we have to present today. And what we're hoping to find out from everybody is um, what are your use cases? What do you uh, want to be able to, to do with this? And um, so we've got a, a place here for you to um, comment on, uh, to leave your comments uh, on, on the GitHub issue. Um, there's a open source reference um, for um, what uh, Ben has shown about behavior graphs. Um, there's a Slack for discussing interactivity. Uh, and of course, uh, the security model. If you're an implementer of, um, of, some, of things like a uh, mapping system or a marketplace or a uh, art gallery somewhere where you would be taking other people's models in and you'd be wanting, wanting to enforce constraints on it. We would love to hear what are the concerns you have with regards to the constraints you need to enforce. And similarly, if you're planning to create content, but you really wanted that content to go somewhere that someone else owns, we'd really like to know where are the types of places that you're intending to put your content so that we understand if you're saying, well, I really need all this power, but I also need it to go into this property that someone else owns. And they're saying, they have these restrictions on power. We want to be able to see that really clearly so that we can make the right set of layer choices uh, for everybody in the ecosystem. And lastly, of course, if you've been using Omnigraph and uh, Unity Visual Scripting and Blueprints, and you have feedback on those systems and what they got right and what you think could be done better, uh, absolutely that feedback would be uh, lovely as well. So thank you all. Uh, with that, we will go to Q&A. I could as well show some of the behavior graph stuff as well, like the uh, reference implementation. Oh yes, if uh, sorry, you can you can uh, reshare. No, just steal this. Yeah, I think you'd like to, Ben. That'd be that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, 
do I want to stop so, your screen sharing? Yes. So meanwhile, folks, uh, those in the call, if you do have some questions, please feel free to put those into the Q&A tab of the webinar. Uh, we are monitoring those. We will uh, look into those right after this demo. So this is the current, this is one uh, possible reference implantation of behavior graphs. Um, you can find it on GitHub. I'll put the link actually just in the chat. Um, okay. Um, and so the idea with this is that um, we have a, a graph based editor uh, created in React by BeagleBug. Um, here, and then you can create graphs in this way. And you can see that it's very similar. We've, we've sort of um, been highly inspired by blueprints. So events are, are red, actions are blue. Here we have a bunch of logic nodes doing some math operations. Uh, and then uh, flow control here, we've got a delay. Uh, and you can see that flow would follow down this path here. Uh, whereas your um, immediate nodes will evaluate to a duration. Um, and also then they also turn into text down here. So um, that's the editor. Um, the way that it's currently implemented is that it's headless. Um, and you can specify JSON as your nodes and um, how to connect them all together. Um, yeah, and it's, we've got a number of examples here showing variables, branching, uh, doing mathematical expressions, um, asynchronous uh, execution. So you can put a delay node there, and then it will restart that execution after that delay has happened. You can do sequences. This is so we, this is an ordered set of operations. So we have a sequence node here that then gets referenced by a bunch of actions. It supports four loops. See the execution there. Custom events. This is very, both of these are very Turing complete. Uh, it doesn't get worse than that. And then we did some performance testing and we found that this current reference implementation does currently execute at a roughly 2 million nodes per second uh, on my Mac Mini. So that's what we have um, so far. We're working um, to make it easy to integrate into other libraries. Um, we're also um, adding more mathematical operations and sort of 3D specific notes to it at this time. And I will let someone else share this back or steal it back if they want. But anyways, we can go to questions. Q and A. Yeah, Kevin, just one more. I think uh, folks are looking for that link, and oh, the chat might be disabled. Um, okay. Oh yes, my is the panelist. Yeah, so. Give me a sec. Yeah, I'm not sure how to chat to everybody else. Uh, I can type an answer for Arnold, but um, it basically would be the, the link you have on the top of the screen there. GitHub.com. Yeah. Be Houston. Behave dash graph. Um, it's it should be in the chat now. Oh, perfect. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Who okay, wants so to run we probably get into our Q&A unless there's more demo content, you guys. Uh... No, I think that's all the demo content we have. So yes, let's, uh, let's do Q&A. Awesome. Thank you both. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have a question from, from Jim. Um, have folks looked at, at Neo's VR logic or VR chat read on for inspiration? I imagine a use case could be people wanting to make the creations more interoperable across other places. It sounds like they have to remake it though. I can answer that. Sure, yeah, by all means. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, then, I, ben, if you guys want to turn your cameras on, uh, we can put those on now and we have the full, uh, full gallery view here now. Uh, does mine work? Mine does not work for some reason. Oh. <laughs> yeah, my camera doesn't work. That's okay. That's um, okay. Yeah, I would say that right now, um, this is a, a new standard. So uh, actually, it's a standard that doesn't even have a full specification. So currently, um, no tools officially support it. Um, but the, the idea is that as it becomes uh, specified out um, and formalized and approved, um, a lot of tools could actually adopt it. And, and such that, uh, there we go. Um, a lot of tools could adopt it. And it may be possible for Adobe Arrow to export to it. 
um, other creation tools to export to it. Maybe it can even be exported by Unity and Unreal if they use a subset of their nodes. Um, maybe Omniverse could export to it. The idea is that with a behavior graph system, um, almost anything can be supported if the queries and the setters, the actions, do what you need them to do. Um, because you can express that logic. It may be cumbersome to express, but uh, it can be expressed and it can likely be automated, automated, ad automatically exported to that. It is also very likely um, that this can be imported to those high-end game engines. So this would be a way, wouldn't it be amazing that you could create a smart object and then import it into Unity or import it into Unreal Engine and it actually works. Like this, this configurable bike actually works. You see the variables exposed in Unreal, you can set them. Like that's, maybe it could even, ex you could have a hat that you could wear in the metaverse that has behaviors and it works in a whole bunch of different game engines. That's sort of the goal we're driving to, or one goal that we're driving towards. And it, it actually could possibly work, but it does have to get standardized first and then everyone invests in adopting it. You sort of can't do that. So first. that is, that is the path. So, is, so that kind of leads into our next question too from Kim, you know, how do you foresee, and maybe I want to ask you this one, but how do you foresee such cool features rolling out into a web browser platform? You know, could we end up with a bunch of browsers that, uh, are not supporting these same node types, and, and we get a you know a fragmented browser world. You know, aside from the cu couple of popular game engines, how do we roll this out? Um, you know, to the web. Yeah, so I could answer that one. Definitely, there's there's no expectation that the browser should have to do anything for almost any of the nodes that we could think of. Uh, the general intention is the nodes should be implementable in JavaScript, so that um, browser independently, it should all work. Uh, the only places where you may have issues there are, for example, if you're in a web browser that doesn't support uh, WebXR or things of that sort, and, and you want it to be in XR, maybe there'll be some capabilities you don't have there. If people were trying to go like really crazy and putting nodes for like uh, for um, NFC payment systems or nodes for um, just things that, that involve access to hardware outside of what the web browser can get to, uh, then yes, then you're at the point where uh, you might be fragmented. But as long as the node is executing something that browsers can do, which is every node we thought of so far, uh, you should be fine. Yeah, in fact, I would say this is designed sort of web first, given sort of the history of GLTF. Therefore, we're not doing a lot of the, the game engine specific stuff right now. Um, such as like enemy hit testing, they do damage, they do hit testing, um, splash damage, all of that is not currently here. The level control that they have is not currently here. So it is web first. So guarantee it's gonna work on the web. Um, less so some of those game specific stuff may not export to this format, at least initially, but we doing the layered approach. You can determine how many of those layers or subsets you support. The more you support, the more interoperable those objects are. Everybody heard it. Ben guarantees it's going to work on the web. <laughs> um, okay, question from Anthony. I'm going to take a stab at this one, but guys, feel free to supplement it if you want. Uh, Anthony's asked, you know, great talk. Thank you to both to everyone. How do you think about fragmentation of file types? Is this a risk? What about extensions? Is there a reason to avoid extensions in favor of a new file type? And I assume this is a little bit in reference to the GLXF uh, file extension that we, we recently announced uh, or went public with a few weeks ago. Um, you know, on one perspective, I think we need to strive to keep GLTF lean and easy to implement for adopters and, and avoid bloating it with everything. And that really is where the extension framework comes into mind. Um, but I think when we started talking about GLXF, and I'm sure you guys can talk about this too, we really wanted to make sure that this was distinctly something uh, within the GLTF family and umbrella, but doing something different than just 30 assets. It was really enabling um, more than one asset to operate in the same scene and then eventually even interact with each other through some of the development we're working here. So it's a balancing act between keeping something streamlined and, and uh, you know, monolithic inside of a file format versus easy to implement um, for, for, for adopters. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the balancing act that Roe was doing and that's how GLXF was born is this is the logical, at least uh, in our current line of thinking, logical place to kind of make that split. Um, you know, we're not trying to create a new extension for every piece of new development, but in this case, it makes sense with GLXF, right? Um, I don't know if you guys have a different opinion on that or, or want to add to it. Yeah, I mean, I could add that the GLXF format and the GLTF format are like the same format. There's nothing different in parsing <laughs> them. Really, the only thing that's different between those two is just that by looking at the suffix after the dot, you can predict whether you're going to receive a leaf node or a non-leaf node, and therefore you can reason about whether you wanted to receive it. Um, that's it. The, the same format, 
just the X is telling you this has references. Yeah, I think uh, I think adding behaviors to GLTF, the base format is fine. Um, the one thing you want to do is you want to make sure that when the scene loads up, if the thing does not support behaviors, your object at least looks passable. So if you had a configurable bike, make sure that the first bike it loads, like by default without running any behaviors, looks right. And then maybe you won't have the interactivity, but that's okay. You didn't support it. Um, just make sure it doesn't like have to run the behaviors to initialize your model. I would say I think it doesn't really matter if it is it a new extension or not. That's more of a choice. Yeah, thank you for that question, Anthony. Uh, thank you guys for answering. Um, okay, we have a question from uh, Diananda. Uh, with undergrad and USD, universal scene description, I can also build in simulation and physics interactivity within the scene. Is that something that GLTF will provide in the future? Uh, certainly, there are no draft <laughs> systems that do simulations. Um, I don't know that, um, I, th I think there are simulation systems that can be compiled to JavaScript. So I, I don't know that we can't include it. Um, it's not um, something we've we've heard yet. So that's part of the reason why we're having this webinar and asking everyone for use cases. Um, if there's a lot of demand for, uh, for physics simulations and things of that sort, it would be good for us to know that. Uh, it probably wouldn't be the first layer that we would roll out. I don't think that's necessarily the, the initial highest demand thing. Um, but it would be good to know if that's a layer that people want. On that front, I would argue um, that uh, node graphs are not required for physics. Physics are actually mostly node properties, saying that this is a kin kinematic object that has this weight, these friction properties. And if we just support that as node properties within GLTF, outside of node graphs, then you can have proper physics behavior. Um, the physics, uh, and then once you have that as like a standard GLTF extension, irrespective of interactivity, then maybe you can start to set those from within a, a GLTF interactive thing where it might initialize some starting conditions or you touch something and it shoots a box. But I would say that there's, this is, the interactivity doesn't do physics, but it could control the physics that are, that exist. So I think it's two separate extensions. It's a physics extension and then letting allowing the interactive layer to then set those properties. Yeah, and yeah. that's the nice thing about that Sparta potato model is that um, I'm going to start using the term spread up potato model more often. Uh, the <laughs> great thing about that is that we can have the interactivity system. And then when someone does make a physics extension, it can have here's physics properties and here's apply force uh, node, right? And similarly, if someone's making any other extension, audio extension, if they're making a video texture extension, all those can have the here's the data that goes into GLTF and here's one new node that you need to control it. And um, that's, that's sort of the model that, that everything should come out with uh, as we add features in the future. Yeah, and I'll also have a little bit more maybe a higher level commentary too. Like, you know, we look at, you know, systems like Omnigraph and USD. Um, these are players that, um, you know, they're established, they have, they have history, they're very, very capable pieces of technology. These are things that, you know, GLTF as a, as a file format, as an open standard, we want to maintain cooperative relationships with these other projects. You know, I don't think it's fair or even uh, the right path to choose to try and you know, get into an adversarial, even competitive relationship with any of these. We really need to figure out the right way to cooperate uh, with these other, you know, projects and pieces of technology, such that, you know, um, what you do in simulation and physics within USD is probably going to be a little bit different than what you might expect and, and what you will be able to do with GLTF. You know, GLTF has its own purposes and, and uh, its own place in the ecosystem. And, uh, you know, will we, our, our main mission is to make sure that we have a good cooperative and, you know, positioning GLTF as a good um, distillation and even delivery target. For, from some of these other pieces of technology. So uh, we, will something, will GLTF support in the future? I'd say the answer is probably yes, but what exact shape or form will it take will largely depend on how these relationships grow and, and, and what's also going on in the rest of the ecosystem, like with Omnigraph, like with USD, um, if that makes sense. Uh, okay, we have a question from Neil. Uh, can we indicate the possible timeline for development and rollout? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll say from a high level that this has been a topic that we've been talking about for months. Um, we've been a little bit careful about the communication just to make sure that we uh, have thought about it enough internally. Um, you know, we started to roll out things like, uh, you know, on our public repository for GLXF. Timelines, <laughs> we're, we're probably very close to having some, some public facing material. I mean, the stuff that Ben presented is already uh, available on public repositories. Um, we're probably very close. I don't know if Dwight, you want to comment a little more without being uh, 
Yeah, I think uh, when when we presented it at, at SIGGRAPH, I think we we had uh, some alternate uh, alternate um, ideas that we needed to merge together. And uh, you can see in the presentation today that we're that we're still looking at exactly how does layer zero fit together with the rest of it. And I think that's um, that's the issue where we we want to get to a proper solution to. Uh, so we're looking for all of your input on use cases and and not only what do you want to do, but where do you want to put your content so that we can understand, does your content have these types of restrictions? Uh, does that, does that um, destination for your content have these types of restrictions that we were talking about at layer zero? I think as soon as we've got that resolved, then we can start to roll out some of these pieces. So um, I hope it's in. Soon. <laughs> Thank you, Dwight. Um, <clears throat> question from Adriano, we came in late. Um, did you guys talk, or I know we haven't talked about material lags, but um, what about material X uh, or some other sort of embedded materials and shaders? It's an interesting topic. Uh, you know, seems to be in lately. Um, could let could material could we leverage this node network to do something like material X is doing? No. Um, material graphs are unfortunately a separate type of uh, graph-based system. They actually do not have the flow control um, through the node systems. Uh, they have to compile down to a shader language, so like GLSL or the new thing for web gpu um so they're actually quite different that said though um there is work uh on look exploring uh, material x because material x is awesome and a great solution to procedural materials so i think the answer is yes material x is awesome and there's research there but it is a distinct effort um an anonymous question came in are there nodes in the proposal to um, manipulate camera input similar to Spark AR Studio? Yeah. Right. Okay, I would say that obviously in um, uh, in cases where you're in augmented reality, virtual reality, things of that sort, you do not want to move the user's camera on uh, on them because it messes with their head. Uh, but in all other contexts, that seems perfectly reasonable. I guess the issue with that one, um, and that's a very good question, is because in many viewer contexts, like say model viewer, you're actually not using a camera that's a scene node in the original GLTF. It's outside of the GLTF context. So that's actually something that we should consider. It is, because right now, uh, to be honest, we have, we're looking at a proposal that can modify just about anything that's in the GLTF file. So materials, properties of those materials, any node properties like translation scale, rotation, trigger animations, but this is outside of the, the GLTF file. So that, that's a really good question. And I don't think, I'm not sure. Mm. Probably, we should add that. <laughs> to do that. <laughs> that's why we're here. That's why we're here to get these kinds of inputs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I would assume you would, you would definitely want to be able to manipulate it in cases where the camera control is coming from the animation tracks or anything else, right? But you would not want to be able to ma manipulate it in places where the user is expecting to have autonomy over the camera. So yeah, so you almost like have to query the context. Yeah, or or you have like usually what they do is I think the nodes go, hey, focus on me, or focus on this sub part of the object, and then maybe you're in an AR context, and actually that becomes a null law. Right. I'm not right. sure. Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, how does this proposal or even behavior graph? Um, interact with KHR animation pointer proposal, which is kind of an early uh, or in development um, uh, extension right now. Uh, and for those who don't know, it defines a set of animatable properties, lets you animate anything within GLTF. Will nodes be defined for all properties that are animatable? Uh, how does that you know compare contrast with what's going on with an animation pointer? Yeah, so that's one that we've been looking at. Uh, if we if we use the animation pointer concept, I think we can greatly simplify the number of nodes that we need because then you just have like one node of set or interpolate whatever you like and use animation pointer to indicate what it's manipulating. Um, so yeah, that's one we're actively uh, actively looking at. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, would this graph editor or, or you know interact interactive system work for changing uh, material dynamically in a web browser? Uh, and you would it work through with 3 gs to see real time some material adjustment it would be really helpful for designers uh, with a low knowledge of coding to experiment with maybe material options. Yes. Uh, if you look this um, the person who brought up the JSON animation pointer 
That's a brilliant comment um, because if you look at that specification, um, that actually shows how to uh, query or or set anything in the GLTF file, including animation or including material properties. So if we support that as a node to set or get those via that that interface, then you can look at that extension, see everything it can set. Um, it can't set everything because some things are viewed as as not like real time settable. Um, but yeah, have a look at that extension. That includes all of that. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Um, so what about future plans beyond, you know, layer zero? Um, you guys have some ideas about what we can do to, you know, make interactivity and GLTF, uh, interactivity within GLTF, um, constantly pushing the boundaries, so to speak. So I should clarify that we're not at this point planning necessarily to roll out layer zero first before we roll out layer one, layer two, et cetera. The layers may, some parts of the layers may come out in order based on when things are ready. Um, but some parts of the layers may be there because a particular uh, a particular site, a particular destination for your content may say, we accept only layer zero content. Please do not use any other layers or we will summarily reject your, your submission, right? Um, so we may be coming out with layer zero and layer one at the same time when we when we publish anything. We're not committed to that yet. Um, but if we were to do that, then we would already be far beyond with layer one. We would already be far beyond um, the um, uh, the capabilities of of um, any other um, formats that are uh, that are out there at the moment. I think for for transfer of content. Thank you, Dwight. Um, this may have already been covered, um, you know, based on the JSON pointer stuff, but um, would you be able to manipulate or even you know, animate in that case, uh, individual vertices of a mesh? I'm guessing not because of performance reasons on some devices where it's costly to move data between general and GPU memory, but I don't know. Currently that's not supported by uh... Uh, the JSON animation pointer. Um, so currently, no. Uh, that's generally not done in games dynamically. So I would say that's leave it for the future. <laughs> On the other hand, what you may be trying to accomplish with that is maybe you have morph shapes and you want to change your blending between your morph shapes. Uh, that would be much more common. That way you're moving a large number of vertices at the same time between different pre-specified positions, like I have the person who is smiling, and I also have the positions of all their vertices for a frown, and I want to be able to move them from smiling to frown. Very, very reasonable use case. It is far more efficient to move one variable that is smile amount and to get all the vertices moving together than to try to make a behavior graph that individually moves uh, millions of vertices. So that's probably more likely the sort of thing that that uh, you'd see in the, uh, in the specs. Okay, just seeing what else we have unanswered. Uh, I think Ben's answered that. Yeah, you can still ask the ones that I'm answering. I'm just also trying to help. Sure. So we, uh, I guess, as part of the initial rollout, you know, uh, are we considering like a Perlin or Voronoi noise um, as an initial input for some of these nodes? Um, yeah, I, I think querying textures is out of scope. Uh, that's actually fairly involved to like read through back from GPU memory. It's not supported by KHR uh, JSON animation pointer. Again, that's really, I would say, that currently is defining our, our, our capabilities and then add animation playing. Um, that was sort of like viewed as, and so that's not supported. It does actually get somewhat complex too, because maybe you have uh, HDR textures or sampling issues, all of that. Um, Perlin, Voronoi, noise, maybe. That's a really good request. I think we should consider it. It's not super hard to implement. But interestingly enough, even if we don't implement it, you can still make it out of nodes. It's just a little bit less efficient. Um, in Material X, though, they do support noise uh, built in. Yeah. Um, so on the shader side, because it's so common, it's, it's usually built in. Mode. Yeah, this is the first material thing. Yeah. So we do have a question, or maybe a request from Andrew. Um, he'd love to see something like Material X. Um, maybe on the next webinar. So you know, I can't say that we we, we are working. Uh, you know, we, we do have some some uh, projects going on with related to Material X. Uh, we do have a GLTF PBR node uh, being worked on in there. Um, some interesting stuff going on there. So I think we'll take it under consideration to organize one of the next webinars. Um, you know, we do have we did one last week actually about PBR, but maybe one of the next ones around materials and PBR. 
could have a little more, more of a material X um, uh, spin on it. Um, Andrew, if you have some specific things you'd like to get you know, answers to, I encourage you to reach out to us and we'll, we'll try our best to make sure that is covered in an upcoming webinar. Uh, another question from Andrew, would swapping between textures on the model be a potential use case? Yeah, we've definitely been thinking um, of, of uh, for example, there's a um, material um, uh, material overrides, is that the name of the extension, um, that allows you to, to uh, pre-specify a number of different- um, material, material variants, yeah. Material variants, yes, that's it. All right, there's a material variance uh, specification that allows you to um, uh, specify various combinations of materials that you might want to use in a model. That's definitely one that uh, would be a great candidate to have a, um, uh, to have a, a, a node to control um, and uh, and possibly directly um, swapping textures as well individually might also make sense. Okay. Um, a question that came in about GLXF, um, does it have its own registry? It seems confusing to, to create GLTF extensions uh, or standalone documents and keep it in sync with another similar name GLTF extension or composite document. Um, to be fair, I, I don't think we've that decision has been made yet. I, I would I would vote to not fragment that, that ecosystem, uh, GLTF ecosystem, I should say, um, more or anything like that. Um, I think it probably makes sense to share a common registry, um, but I don't think you know decisions or even discussions have even happened on that. And this is very, very early days and we are taking feedback for GLXF. Um, so I think this piece of feedback is, is important for that. Um, I agree it would be confusing. So I think that's you know probably a conclusion that we could have reached, but um, you know, uh, we appreciate the input on that, and I think uh, that's probably the way it's going to go. But we'll we'll see how this evolves. <laughs> yeah, and we're certainly expecting that new new extensions as we're writing this interactivity one. We're certainly expecting that we would write this extension and say, "Here's an extension that applies to both." Right. And so, if people are going to write lots of extensions that apply to both, it makes it easier to have one registry. So, <laughs> certainly, that would be our preference. Right. I think it's important to, to emphasize that GLXF is not something different from GLTF, as we said before, you know, it is part of the GLTF family, which has a different couple of letters after the dot, right? Uh, okay, I'm looking through, looking through. Um, <clears throat> which runtime do you envision adding support for this? Uh, through JS, Babylon, Unity? Uh, we probably hope all of them, but <laughs> there are a few front runners. <laughs> yeah, so the 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 previous uh, webinar that we gave at, at um, uh, at SIGGRAPH, um, we had a pre-recorded uh, demo of, um, of work that uh, Microsoft had done to add uh, some of an early prototype of this into, into Babylon, and I believe um, Ben's demoed uh, his in 3JS, so um, I would hope uh, that, that both of those would continue as we get closer to something final, and, uh, and I would hope that we'd see support in both. Yeah, I think it's going to go to all the WebGL um, or the browser-based ones pretty quick. Um, I think it's the the native ones, right? Like when someone's maintaining their own implementation, especially if it's not in JavaScript, or uh, that's a more challenging one because now they have to implement this engine or port it. Right now, this reference implementation that you can just steal and put in your thing only is in JavaScript. So uh, it becomes more of a challenge. Yeah, so we are expecting that that layer zero is probably primarily there for the uh, the sort of embedded use cases, right? If you if you've sent someone a a text message of some sort that allowed you to bundle your GLTF into your message, and the message viewer itself directly rendered the message in your viewing context without ever opening a browser, right? Those are the types of situations where people have a lot more care about um, being able to evaluate that this content is not doing something they don't want. Those are the ones that we think that layer zero is going to be used for. And now with Unity and Unreal, because they have a graph-based system, the idea is that this can likely be translated to their graph-based systems uh, during an import step. Now, I understand that those graph-based systems do not compile at runtime, though. So that means that uh, at least initially, you're looking at uh, design time imports working, possibly not runtime imports. I could be wrong on that front, but that's my understanding. Yeah. And actually I have a question. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, yeah, sorry. They have that problem actually with GLTF right now. Um, they can't actually import uh, very well uh, GLTFs dynamically because all their shaders have to be predefined. So right now they're defining these very a shader that does possibly absolutely anything that a GLTF could do, and then they're plugging in those parameters at runtime. But it leads to very complex shaders. 
Um, so they have that, um, they might also have a problem importing material X shaders because of that same reason, uh, unless they add native support for material X to those engines. So, but I think that that's where the industry is going to end up going. Uh, it's just the current engines haven't yet adapted to that, that change that's coming. Yeah, and I think the, the, the person who asked the initial question, um, you know, uh, you clarified the question a little bit, are we actively pushing for support in these engines? Um, and I would say, you know, the folks at Unreal, the folks at Unity are part of the uh, 3D formats working group. Uh, they do participate in the cause and provide feedback. Um, I would say that if we get through this and we don't have support within the major engines, we did something wrong. Uh, with some of the other ones, you know, we, we talked about uh, 3JS was mentioned and Ben has a great experience with 3JS. Uh, Babylon was mentioned and they, you know, Microsoft and Babylon are active participants as well. Um, it's, you know, what we're trying to do here is make sure that we're developing something that um, is what the ecosystem needs and what the players are also uh, needing as well. So I would say we're not pushing um, for adoption. We are cooperatively finding these proposals to make sure that it meets everyone's requirements such that it's it's not something that we have to go sell for. It's something that the ecosystem was already asking for and wanted to. And, and what we end up creating is matching and compatible with what um, these ecosystem players are already, already thinking of doing. Um, and, and that's the way we're not burdening, and that's that's working, you know, pretty well for the most part. Um, but if there are other specific engines that you think are, are kind of left out of this equation, uh, those are the ones that we, you know we want to hear about. We want to get your feedback on, uh, and make sure that we have the proper engagement with with these players. Hope that answers the question. I don't know if there was uh, anything else you guys wanted to add about that. Um, <clears throat> trying to see if there's any other questions that we can answer. We have only a few minutes left, so maybe one or two more questions, and then we'll, we'll have to wrap it up. Um, <clears throat> is there a particular reason for a graphic system instead of a component-based system? Um, component-based or you're a component-based. You're talking about like entity component frameworks that are usually used in game engines. Is is that what you're referring to? Those usually do require code. So you have to include like some type of coding to, to achieve that. So my, my concern with that is code is a lot harder to um, validate that it's not doing something you don't want it to. Also, you have to choose a language that now everyone has to use that language. Like if you use JavaScript, now everyone has to support JavaScript at runtime, or if you come up with your own, it's even more of a challenge. So I would say that that's harder to have everyone support. Um, it's also sort of not where the industry has gone. Almost all custom behavior right now at the high end is these no graphs. So I would say that um, I, I don't want to be too smart. I want to do what everyone else like. They're sort of showing the way we're trying to catch up with open standards as what sort of like the way that things usually work is you have people pushing ahead and they're coming with proprietary systems. And then what happens is there's a consolidation process. And the consolidation process happens with open standards. They look at the high ends. They turn that into a standard. And that's what we're doing. So if component systems were the standard at the high end, then we should, oh, you're saying it's not. But whatever is the standard at the high end, that's what we're trying to do. General components, connections to other components. I, I don't understand. If you could show an example, then maybe we could talk about it. But right now, I don't understand what you're talking about. Yeah, I encourage you to come join our, our Slack channel. Maybe we can have a, a more broad discussion because we are kind of running on time here. Um, one more question from, uh, yeah, and a recording would be sure as well. Um, one last bit of question from Martin, maybe. We've spoken about consumers, engines to integrate this. Uh, how about producers? Are we hoping that some large editors will be able to edit those graphs and export them into the format? Um, well, I kind of covered it before, I think, but we're doing more than hoping. We're trying to work directly with, with these players such that you know it's a vibrant ecosystem all the way from authoring to um, delivery and runtime experiences. So we're doing more than hoping. We're, we're actively you know, engaging with these folks to make sure. Um, and you know, we, we have folks like, like Dwight from, uh, from Adobe who's directly working on the production side of these things to make sure that um, you know, they, we're covering the entire spectrum of use cases. Um, I don't know if you want to add more about that, Dwight. Um, yeah, so uh, at Adobe, we build uh, authoring tools. We try to make it so that everybody can uh, can create uh, content in all sorts of different formats. And and yeah, if the if the concern is, will I be able to author content for this? Uh, we definitely uh, are focused on that. Um, uh, right now, we uh, I, I run a product called Adobe Aero, which is designed to do um, authoring of interactivity, primarily for augmented reality. Um, and uh, at some point, uh, we hope we'll get uh, uh, we'll get that able to work with these specs once they're once they're published. Right on, thank you, Dwight. So I think we are at time. Uh, once again, I invite you guys all to uh, pick up this conversation on our 
our Slack channels uh, on our GitHub repositories. Uh, we are actively soliciting feedback for everything we talked about here today and more. So please uh, don't ever be a stranger to reach out to us. Um, you know, we are, we, we do want to talk with you and gather your use cases and requirements and, and even critiques. Um, that's why we're having these, these engagement opportunities like we are today. And, you know, uh, you can look forward to more webinars uh, with more news uh, coming up in the future. Thank you all. Thank you, gentlemen. That was a great pre presentation and excellent Q&A session. Appreciate it very much. As a reminder, a recording of this presentation, along with the slides, will be available on the Kronos Group website, and a direct link will be sent to you in a follow-up email. As you leave the webinar, please take a moment to fill out the survey that pops up. Your feedback is important to help us improve these presentations. Please let us know if there are other Kronos-related topics you may be interested in, and thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the webinar. Have a great day.